So before we get started, I think we need to make the call for the a note taker volunteer. Thomas, you want to? Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Appreciate that. So Thomas. If you use the official tool, someone will help you usually. Any, anyone else wants to contribute, feel free to. Um, should we get started? Yeah. Know, Brian, do you want to lead it? Do you want me to lead it? Uh, let, let, let me do it for this time and then you can do it next okay. time. Sounds good. Um, so. Uh, note well, uh, it's, it's Wednesday. You all have seen this many times, but um, this meeting is completely under the note well procedures and all of the uh, reference documents. You're, you're driving, Chris, so next slide. Oops. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the uh, IESG did not uh, approve our charter yet they say they will at the next next telechat which will be the end of this month um so we are officially here as a boff um our charter is available if you want to go look at it and we think it's going to be approved as is um but uh this is not an official meeting so we can't adopt any documents yet we can't uh do any other official business but uh, we can maintain the agenda that we have. We can discuss all the ideas um, that we have. Um, we can discuss direction. We can dis discuss drafts. It's uh, almost everything is okay except making decisions. Any questions about that? Okay, next slide. So uh, here's our agenda. Um, the, the typical bash. Um, Jonathan is going to present the contact user uh, use case. Um, I'm going to protect uh, pre um, present the emergency call ecrit use case. Rowan is going to do message conversation exchange. And then <clears throat> Dan has a proposed VCon connector container. Um, uh, if we're pressed for time, Dan's, we'll cut Dan's because it's solutions rather than problems. Um, but hopefully we will have plenty of time for everyone uh, and, and a short wrap up. Any issues with the agenda? All right. Anything else we wanna discuss before we get going? Otherwise, Jonathan. All right. You want to you want to present his slides. Yeah, you guys. So you'll you're driving the slides. I can if you want. I'm not driving. Chris is going to drive them. Chris is driving the slides. Okay. There we go. Uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> They're not in there. No. I think Jonathan, you're. I, I wonder if you put them in too late or. Oh really? Um, no, it might hang 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 on a second. I might be able to cause it. Um, yeah, they're not there. I did. I did. Didn't you see them? I sent the. I mean, they. Were, I got a mail that said they were officially uploaded. Okay. For I don't see them in the list in our slide set. All I see is the ones that are there. Um, you have to approve it. Did you do the approval? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let me get in. Hang on, um, I'll be there in a short. Should I just share them from my desktop? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, hang on one second. Uh, 
Refresh. Huh. I don't see um, approval. Can you can you email them to me? Yeah. Um, let's see if I just go back to data tracker and see if it's asking me for anything. I think there isn't there a timing thing. Yeah, there is, but I I can fix that, but I don't yeah. see them in the queue. Oh, okay. I don't see them uploaded right. at all. Sorry. Here we go. Wait My bad minute. because you know I just did these like no. twenty minutes ago. Um, yeah, and 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 if Rohan's around, I haven't seen anything from him. Hello. He's working on them right Is now, right, Rohan? Yeah. yeah, right. Um, As is typical. Uh, you you could try to share them directly, Jonathan. I think. All right, hang on. I I I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Oh, okay, you're gonna. Do uh, I found I found. It did not, the approval didn't go in. Um, so I, I'm back on the approval and let's just see if this is now here. Um, I'm gonna do this again. No, not there, an X-ray to be saying, still not showing up. All right, email. Do you want me to share them locally? Yeah, yeah. Let them let them share. Go ahead. The new, the new we're 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 getting we're new at this. Sorry. I'm not Did doing you this. I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know how to share slides. I, I hit the ask to share button, but it didn't let me pick the app or anything. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, all right. Oh, goodness. Are you trying to share it, Brian? Or do you want me to? I'm, I am. I am about to try to share it now that I've got them on my my local machine. Let's just see if it'll let me do this. Uh, What's that? It's uploading those and then show. Not all these different days in the queue and show. Okay. Now it's there. You can open. You can help. You can transcript you can, by the way. I just want to say reading the transcript <laughs> alongside here. Yes. <laughs> this is like right. my favorite ITF transcript so far. Uh, all right. So it's available to share now. You you Chris, you should be able to share them now. Yes, I see them now. Way I... Hey. <laughs> All right, uh, chair, chairs apologize for not not getting it together yet. Yeah. Well, or and the and the presenter apologizes for doing the slides like twenty minutes before the meeting. So, but at least I beat Ron. So that's you know who's still working on his slides. So that's that's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let me jump into it. Um, so apologies, I couldn't be there in person. Um, honestly, the fine dining just isn't good enough in Prague. Uh, no, I kid you. Um, <laughs> Um, partly. Um, so we're going to talk about contact center use cases for uh, for VCon. So this is a draft I wrote with uh, my colleague uh, Andrew Siciliano, who's here in the in the meeting as well. He's uh, actually the a lead of a five nines portfolio in this area as a deep expert. So glad to have him here with us. Um, if we hit the next slide. Uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, in case folks aren't as familiar, I think many of us understand conferencing and telephony contact center is a little bit of a stepchild in the real-time communications uh, area. So what does it do? It handles interactions between a business and their customers. 
Uh, most people think of inbound, but there is also outbound where the, the uh, business places outbound calls or SMSs or emails. These are not all just robocalls, which is, I know, uh, unfortunately, a decent chunk of them, but a lot of them are actually desirable things like notification reminders to come pick up your prescription or what have you. Um, they usually provide a mix of self-service and live agent handling, self-service where you you know you use uh, buttons on the phone or speak to the system and get things done. The main component is called the ACD and it's primarily a matching engine that routes the calls to agents based on things like you know how much time is the agent spent today on calls and what's their skills and does it match with the customer needs. And it's usually not just voice, other things like SMS, email, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger and other social channels. So again, just a brief, that's what Connect Center is. Next slide. Where it starts to intersect VCon is this, that uh, probably a little bit less well known is there's, in the Connect Center, there's a pretty big um, uh, set of vendors and products in the market and technologies that I'll roughly call supporting applications. Um, in the industry, these are often known as WFO or WEM. Uh, acronyms change every few years. Uh, and they're sort of add-ons, um, and there's a few different categories that are pretty relevant for VCon. Probably the, the primary one and the core of all of it is recording, um, which is simply the act of taking these calls, chats, and emails uh, and recording them. Why do you want to record them? Um, the, re the, the why is also important for VCon here. Um, one is compliance, uh, which is that... Uh, you know, later they legally have to store and save recordings in certain vertical segments, that's the case. Uh, similarly, archival, just have access to them in case, you know, customer calls or there's some question about what happened. Someone wants to go retrieve and look at them. Um, and the, historically, the main use case is this thing called quality management, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, probably pretty important to note again for VCon use cases is that this often includes screen recording. Um, and think of that like screen share, except as a Connect Center agent, basically you're, you're handling calls or chats for customers, like Big Brother is watching like everything. And your entire screen through the whole day is pretty much being watched and recorded. So uh, there are legit use cases for it, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a second, but this is part of the recording in addition to the actual audio and text uh, recording of the session. A major function of these recording products uh, and of the problem at hand is PCI credit card redaction. It's not uncommon. You, you speak to someone in the Connect Center and they, they ask you to read a credit card out to them. Uh, and uh, regulations and compliance are pretty clear. You want to not store that information. Um, how you remove that from the recording is a pretty complicated process. There's, there's a bunch of different ways it gets done. Um, I think I talked a little bit more about this. Uh, uh, no, I don't. Sorry. So generally, for example, what happens is that um, uh, someone goes and uh, like it embeds scripts in the web page itself where the credit card numbers are entered by the agent. And when the agent like clicks in the field where the credit card number is supposed to be stored, it sends a um, some kind of signal to the back end application to stop recording at this time. Uh, is one way. Other cases, agents actually have a little widget on their desktop where they can press a button and they can pause the recording manually. Um, there are other use cases where um, the agent transfers the call to a voice response system to collect the credit card number so that it's never even on the wire uh, where the recording is being done. So there's a bunch of different solutions um, out there for this, but a, but a key part of it is redacting that information um, and of course, once it's redacted in the recording and gets these requirements, you want to know where it was redacted and that it was credit card number without the number itself. Uh, so recording and redaction are one big thing. And that drives um, two main use cases that, that are used. One is quality management um, and the other is speech analytics. Quality management is um, if you've ever called the Connect Center and you've heard, thank you for calling. Your call may be recorded for monitor for uh, uh, training and quality purposes, right? You've probably all heard this stupid announcement in time you called the Connect Center, right? Um, that refers to this capability. And what it does is it, it takes those call recordings uh, and there's a product called quality management that um, allows a, a, a user, usually like a, a quality manager, there are departments in Connect Centers that do this. And, and someone goes and listens to some subset of these recordings 
of these calls. And there's a rubric that they use to score the agent. Did they greet the customer nicely? Did they upsell a product? Did they not yell? What have you? And those scores are collected and sent back to the agents for coaching and, and training and improvement. So that's basically someone who listens to the recordings, basically. Uh, increasingly that, as you would expect, that's moving to an automated process using transcription and natural language understanding uh, technologies. Uh, most Connex understand are at a mix. Um, and a big part of it too, and it's this one's particularly relevant for VCon, is that in this case, the, the, the quality management is on the performance of the agent. So if a call bounces between three agents before it's done, there's three separate, in essence, recordings that are listened to at different times by different people to rate the agent's performance for their piece of it. And so a big part of what these systems do also is stitching the recordings together and presenting different views on the recording to show the segment that's relevant for the training purposes. So again, VCon, we need to make sure we're able to delineate those segments and identify which agents uh, were involved. And the last one is speech analytics which sort of uses a variety of techniques to produce graphs and reports on, you know, what was spoken and were, was the customer angry and, you know, these kind of things. All right, next slide. All right, so in terms of, uh, you know, sort of protocols and where VCon fits in, there's actually two places that are relevant for VCon in this. Um, I, think, I think it's pretty useful to understand that from a use cases perspective. We, we're talking about basically transferring of recordings from the Connect Center on the left and, and these sub supporting applications on the right. I probably should have said this at the outset, sorry. It's super common that the vendors and infrastructure for these supporting applications is not the same as the core Connect Center. Very, very common. Um, and so that, thus a need for an on the wire standard for transferring these things. Today, these things are all done via proprietary file formats, proprietary APIs, um, and so the objective would be to use VCon as an alternative. So, so that shows up here in these two different places. Place number one is the call itself or the chat or the email that needs to include both the recording as well as metadata. I have a slide I'll get to in a moment that lists some of the requirements for this use case on what kind of data we need in there um, and lots of call events. So especially in the Connect Center, Parks, holds, transfers, conferences are the norm and the recordings are complicated beasts with lots of different segments and participants. Um, all that needs to go over, but it doesn't include the desktop recording, which is often sent separately. And that's unsurprising because the desktop recording is not shared with the, customer, the consumer, whereas the voice recording part is. So uh, th that's usually transferred separately, but this is another recording transfer. Usually there's a, a piece of software that runs on the agent desktop that's basically doing the local screen recording and we'll do a post call or batch nighttime upload of these things um, and uh, up to the um, uh, the supporting applications. Next slide. I know this is riveting. Uh, thank you for paying attention. Uh, it, it's a real problem though. Uh, so all right now to the meat. Here's requirements in this document for what, what we would like to use VCon for these two use cases. Um, interaction type, you know, audio screen email, interaction ID, file type. I'll pause on perhaps the non-obvious ones, the media metadata, bit rate channel, channels, participants for each segment. That's particularly important, right? We need like an, a, an ID, uh, like a UUID of some sort. Um, start time, duration, direction. Direction is particularly important um, not just for the segment, but for the, the interaction as a whole. It's quite different whether it starts with the Connex Center calling the consumer or the other way around. Um, that is really important to record. And then details for the participants. The participants going to be, a, you know, mostly agents and then one or um, customer. Um, uh, their ID, first and last name, type, which of those they are, did they initiate or receive. For the consumer, um, additional information is desired as well. I already talked about PII and PCI redaction. So we don't want to know when did that start? When did it stop? What type of info was there and the duration so that there's not this, you know, almost doesn't, doesn't look like a gap in the recording that it was a, a mistake or high packet loss. We can differentiate that redaction segment. Um, specific to Connect Center and common to most of them is this idea of a skill. 
uh, which is a property of the call. There, it, it is a vector. There is usually more than one, or often can be more than one for transfers. This is sort of like think about it like the main reason you're calling. So if you call up and you hear one of these menus, press one for sales, two for support. Sales or support is the skill. Um, and so this is a very uh, key piece of metadata that's often used um, um, in many of these downstream applications. Similarly, campaign is another common um, parameter in these things. Um, basically, most contact centers will take, for example, phone number and map it to a campaign that defines, it's like the container for all the configuration. This is a sales campaign, or this is a support campaign, or this is a you know uh, enrollment campaign for signing up for your health plan this year and has its own dedicated number and voice response script instead of agents. So everything it's a container for pretty much everything. Um, whether or not the call is transferred, metrics like uh, count of transfers and conferences, these things are often used as search, sort, and filter parameters. Who hung up? Disposition is the last of the uh, major connect center pieces of metadata. At the end of the call, an agent uh, has this drop down menu of like, what happened? Was this call successful? Did we complete a sale? Does the customer have to call back? Um, that's a key uh, property that's used for a lot of uh, speech analytics uh, and downstream processing of the call. So we want to put that in there too. For outbound calls, um, they run off these lists of phone numbers uh, and, and understanding what list this is on is also a pretty useful property. These are all real metrics that, that are actually part of the information we 5.9, my company is a contact center as a service vendor. We transfer all of this information today to uh, our the, uh, downstream applications, Ferenc, 5.9 themselves, we own one. So these are real stuff sent to real vendors. That's it. Awesome. Questions? All right. All right. I knew it would be riveting. Thank you. Thomas does have. Yeah. That. Oh, Thomas has a question. Woo hoo! <laughs> Uh, so um, my question for you, Jonathan, is I understand that the current state of the art in the contact center is to identify the customers um, uh, loosely, that is their name, their email address, and, and a phone number. What I've been asked recently is, is there a, um, are there any other higher requirements for identification? so that this is all self-certified stuff that you've said, like for my contact center place, it doesn't really address the identity of the participant from an external viewpoint. So as an example, um, a difference would be that, you, you, no, we'll take five nines for an example. Uh, to, to stay of the art today, as I understand it, is in your system, you'll say it was John Doe and this is his phone number. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, um, what I've been asked about is, uh, would it be escalated into a case where it would be five nines asserts that it was John in this conversation? And so that as you perceive the VCon, it would be five nines that was asserting the authenticity of the participants in the conversation. Oh, you mean like in the stir shaken sense of the word? Yeah, in the stir shaken sense of the word. Uh, today, we're not, we at least we are not including like stir attestation information. Um, that's certainly interesting to most contact centers. Um, at the moment, at least, it's not a requirement. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if people start to ask for that in the future. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a proponent of, of changing the requirements to adding it into the first version of the protocol. I'm just saying that as I hear what people are asking for next, that I hear that quite a bit. And from my perspective, it's been in the um, AI stuff that we've been doing and deep fakes, et cetera. How do I know that this is an actual authentic conversation? Yeah, yeah. That's probably, I mean, again, probably interesting. Not Probably not for these examples. Like these examples, the consumer on the other side is like the purpose of these applications, the quality management, the speech analytics is not about the consumer. So authenticity of the consumer for these use cases is not that critical. There may be certainly other use cases you're thinking of where that's important, um, but, but not for these at the moment. Thank you. You got Dan. This is Dan Petrie, CPC. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan. This is fantastic uh, input. Um, and uh, I know we aren't making any decisions, but I think this is 
you know, dead on where we want to be with with Beacon, and uh, uh, I hope we will continue in this direction with uh, with these use cases. Yep. Sounds good. I think the main the main thing to take away is that there's a lot of metadata. And so, I mean, it, it's already there, but like, you know, extensible metadata properties, ways to group them, category, you know, so that there's a, a Connect Center list, for example, that we can stick in there that everyone else can ignore if it's not those. Those are going to probably be important in the, in the downstream um, use cases, as well as really clear ability to have different segments called out. This is the Connect Center definitely introduces a bunch of fairly complicated uh, use case, uh, requirements on the VCon format. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Did you finish your slides, Ron? <laughs> Just uh, uploaded them. Yeah. So only 15 more right. minutes. Ah, uh, he's he shipped them to me just in time for me to uh, do my presentation. <laughs> so we'll fumble at the end of his. <laughs> That's all right. Um, all right, so this is the emergency call or ECRIT. That ECRIT is the um, ITF work group that works on this stuff. Go to the next slide. So emergency calls are citizen to authority. So here we're talking about 911, 112, that, that kind of thing. Uh, most countries have an organized scheme to do this with a three-digit dial code. Some countries, there's a single code. In others, you have a dial code for each kind of responder. This is all regulated. There's laws that apply to it, and they govern how the system works. Calls are made from many forms of public communications. They're, originally, this was strictly carriers, but it's expanding in most areas to cover um, less regulated carriers, shall we say. Um, calls are answered at a specialized call center, which is called a public safety answering point, or PSAP. So that's the, the term you'll hear a lot, PSAP. Next slide. Um, this is all ITF stuff. Um, we've done this for a while in, in the ITF. And there's a standard, a set of standards that came out of ECRIT that form the basis for per country standards. In North America, there is something called Next Generation 911. And in, EU, in the uh, EU, there's Next Generation 112 that are using common standards. There, there's a goal to maintain a single, uh, eventually get to a single standard. They aren't yet, but they're, we're, we're getting there. Um, ND911 is being deployed in the US and Canada now. Um, some aspects of 112 are being deployed. And this discussion is gonna fo focus on those because they have standards that are much more extensive than what's installed in most countries and in, in the rest of the United States and North, and North America now. Uh, I, I, I don't propose that we try to cover the older systems, only talk about the newer systems. Next slide. So the participants in an emergency call, you have a caller, a call taker, which is sometimes called a telecommunicator. Um, for some calls, you have a dispatcher and occasionally you have a responder. That is, all I'm saying is that the responder doesn't talk to these other people much, uh, especially the caller, except uh, under some, on your, uh, rare circumstances, but it happens. Importantly for this, all calls are logged for legal purposes in QA by a logging service. I'm going to talk a lot about that in the, in the next slides. Um, and another thing to realize is that in most jurisdictions, privacy restrictions otherwise enforced for calls or other re release of data are waived, but there's limits on disclosure. That means that you don't have to tell us, give us permission to get your personal information, your PII, your location, et cetera. Um, but the system is restricted in what it, it can do with that data. Next slide. Uh, the three most important things to know about emergency calls. Next slide. Location, location, and location. Next call. Next slide. Uh, location is used in two ways. Um, most jurisdictions have many PSAPs. That's not true in all uh, countries. There's some countries that literally only have one or two, um, but the location is used to route the call to the PSAP that serves the location of the caller. In the US, there's over 3000 of them. So um, it's not obvious how to do that. Um, and the important part of location for everybody is that you have to get the responder to the right place. Um, 
you you have to be able to direct the responder to get to the place where the the victim is. Um, and obviously, location is the most important metadata. Um, I do want to point out that caller location is not the same as incident location in all circumstances. Sometimes if you're in the car truck crash and you call, your car isn't moving. The, call, the location of you is the location of the crash. Everything is all. But you can, uh, we get calls all the time from, uh, look, my mother is having a heart attack. Where's your mother? Well, she's in San Francisco and I'm in Boston. Um, so uh, we, we, we have more than one location. That's, that's the other thing to go. Next. Um, at the start of a call, um, we have queues where calls arrive at PSAPs. Um, we clearly care about wait time. Who wants to have any wait time when you call, make an emergency call? But it does happen, so we do have queues. We do have IVR and IMR for short waits um, that track this stuff. You, you can get a busy. We don't ever want to hit, see that happen, but the system can be overloaded. Um, there might be multiple queues of call takers. Um, but unlike Jonathan's case, we don't do skill-based routing we, we typically. They're, that's starting to come in a little bit, but, but we don't do that now. Um, media is negotiated with SIP standard stuff, um, STP and all of that. Um, we support audio, video, real-time text, and instant messaging, or any mix of them on any call. Next slide, please. So calls always start with a two-way call between a call taker and a caller. In some circumstances, we dis we transfer to a dispatcher. Um, the transfer is always attended, meaning a bridge is used to mix from three participants, sometimes more. Um, when we start this transfer, both the call taker and dispatcher can hear or see the caller at all times. But the uh, after the dispatcher is on the call, the call taker and the dispatcher can converse without the caller knowing we do this with muting so we're muting audio and video towards the caller um but we're not muting him towards us towards the the system um so we have different views the, the the caller has one view the call taker and dispatcher typically have the same view but they're different from the other ones um <clears throat> then kind of farther along we we open up the 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 muting and now everybody it's now it really is a true way a true three-way call, then typically the primary PSAP would drop off, sorry, would drop off the call and now you're down to a two-way and then you get off the bridge. Um, there is a data transfer that happens when we do this um, using a standardized data uh, that gets what we what the call taker knows about the incident and they transfer that to the dispatcher with a, a data transfer. Sometimes that's all we do. And increasingly, that's all we do. Sometimes the call taker is the only person who ends up talking to the caller. They create all the data and then they just ship the data off to the dispatcher. The dispatcher never talks to the caller. Next. Everything is logged. Everything. We log everything. Um, unlike most systems, unlike Jonathan's use case, we have standardized logging and retrieval protocols and data formats. So in, in next generation 911 and in next generation 112, we standardize both the input and the output of the logging service. Um, <clears throat> we use SIPREC. If you know what, what SIPREC is, it's, it's the standard SIP recording mechanisms. And then we, we play back with our TSP. You'll, you'll see a lot of IETF is in this. Um, relative to uh, VCON, we have a globally unique call identifier assigned by the first entity that encounters the call, and we carry that uh, a call identifier throughout the call and any data associated with the call. Similarly, we have a, a globally unique incident identifier. Incidents are real world events. A call is a call about a real world event. Every new call is initially assumed to be a separate incident and gets a unique incident identifier, but sometimes we discover that this is the second, third, fourth, or even hundredth call about the same incident. And so we end up merging incidents down to the original one, um, to, the, to, the, to the real world incident. Um, all log events include the, log, the, the incident identifier, all log events that, that are attributable to a given call have the call identifier. So we have these, these um, identifiers that are maintained. And we 
they're, they have a specified format. They're used all over the system as well as the logging service. And so we have to tell you what it is. You can't tell us what it is. Although of course we can have a mapping. I see Jonathan in the queue. Do you want to get in a question here? Yeah, quick question, Brian. So this incident identifier, is that actually changed in the like recording metadata or it's just, it stays, it's fixed and, and someone later correlates them together uh, in an offline when, process? When, you, when we do a merge, um, we, uh, we, we specify which is the surviving incident. So we'll say incident 103 merges to incident five, incident five survives. That means that <clears throat> the, the logger has a bunch of incidents for, for um, the 105 incident, um, but thereafter all logging is done against incident five. When you do the retrieve, you can figure out all of that. You, you can see the history of the merge um, and you can track back and get all the all of the incidents from the logger, but there's a, you know, basically there's a multi-step process to do that. I guess the question that's still not clear is like if we have this VCon format and it has the incident ID in it, is there a requirement that there can be an updated incident ID that is modified along with the original one? Like is this is this need to be a list with the current well, flagged you know what i'm saying yeah i do i do understand what you're saying i think the question is when do we're generating the vcon data structure if we're generating it early in a call then the answer is we're going to have to deal with this particular merge problem and either have an incident have the incident id change or have a, have a list or something like that um if 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 we actually only end up using it post-processing or later on in the call um then um it, it, we will know what the real incident is by then. So it kind of kind of depends on what the actual use case turns out to be. Yeah, but wouldn't you want to then modify it later? That's what I'm asking. Po after the call is done, let's well, say you merge the incident, would you want to update this thing in the VCon? So if you transfer it around, the people, someone downstream knows the new incident number? Well, again, it, it, I, I still haven't quite figured out when we want to create the beacon. If we create the beacon before the incident is finished, we may have to deal with this. If right. we create the beacon only after the incident is finished, then we know what the surviving incident ID is and we're okay. I see. Okay, thank you. Yep, next slide. Um, we track people associated with incident and therefore calls. So we have the notion of agents, which are call takers, dispatchers, responders, and sometimes even tow truck drivers are agents. Agents have agent identifiers and the agency they work for has an agency identifier. So anybody in the system, we have unique IDs for them. We track that, that they are assigned to an incident or that they work to call. And, and so we can track who's involved in every, in every call and every incident. We track people who are not agents. Um, we, they have a role, so they're a caller, a victim, a bystander, a parent, whatever. And we have a standardized person object, which has a unique identifier that tracks each person. Um, and we update information on people and different agencies have for different views of what they know about an incident. So you could have, <clears throat> say one agency, this guy said, oh, he was wearing a red jacket. Another one says, no, 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 it wasn't red, it was orange. Um, and we track all that. Um, and we can tie conversation participants to our notion of agents and persons. Um, and we ha I, but again, we have identifiers for all these things, which we have to take into account. And, and we might end up with different, uh, in, a, in, a, in an emergency incident, not everything is clear. So in the middle of an incident, you may think you have three people by the end of the incident, you really only have two. So we have, problems like that. Uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> we today we have very limited use of automated transcriptions and AI, but that's changing pretty rapidly. Um, logging is primarily used for legal proceedings. We have to log. Um, QA use is secondary, but again, increasing. Everybody does do listening of, of calls for QA purposes, but 
analyzing them in any way is pretty rare, but is starting to get very interesting. Um, <clears throat> because we have standardized protocols and data formats, then, then the er earlier systems, the, the ability of, of analytics to deal with the data is increasing rapidly. So that's one of the reasons why it's, it's starting to be more interesting is we have more correlation of data. Mm, that might be it. Next slide. That's it, right. Um, I haven't tried figuring out all the other things, but I've given you a, 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 a top level view of what kind of meta metadata we have. There, there's, there is actually quite a lot more. I didn't, I only had 20 minutes. I wanted to allow um, uh, questions. So we have a lot more standardized data, um, but uh, that this is just a, 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 a the top level of the, people interactions, the conversations. Thomas. First of all, Brian, I want to thank you so much for the for this work as well. I think this is a really great use case. Um, when we first started working on VCONs, Eric Berger um, had mentioned this exact use case as something that might be really important for emergency services. So thank you for that. One of the, the elements of the VCON standard I want to point out uh, is the group section of the VCON. And this might be a perfect use case for fleshing out the group section of the VCON. The group section of the VCON is roughly intended to relate VCONs together. So if you had a block of conversations that in some way related to each other, you could put them in a, in a group, um, right? Yeah. yeah it's, it's jumping mm -hmm. in. How, however, I think this is a great use case for uh, identifying how that might be used because you've got cases that you're dealing with that have multiple VCONs that may be orphaned or killed or, or brought forward in time. So, right, really good right. I mean, I, 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 I had to choose what I was going to talk about, but recognize that there's this conversation between a caller and a call taker. Then there's another conversation between the call taker and the dispatcher. Then there might be another conversation between the dispatcher and the caller, but that that depends on the circumstance. But then there's a discussion between the dispatcher and the responder. And then depending on the circumstance, there might be another conversation that, that's beyond the emergency call use case, but is now getting into all of public safety between the responder and the caller or some other person related to it. You know, when the cop arrives on scene, he starts talking to people. Um, now that's getting way beyond what I know about, but um, that there's definitely lots of related conversations here. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Jonathan, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another question, Brian, is as it relates to the standardization activity, you know, we need to create a standard when we're trying to transfer information between systems own, you know, that are provided by different vendors or manufacturers, right? That's why we make standards. It's um it's unclear to me in the in the not emergency services cases what at what points in time are, is there an actual transfer of a recording with what metadata needs to be in it is there more than one because like for example if the entire thing was a completely closed system where the recordings were stored and accessed all from equipment made by a single vendor then the format is a matter of internal consideration only and not something you need a standard for so I'm trying to understand, like, where 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 is the standardization need come from inside of the emergency response systems? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, a lot of our standardization is is um, an explicit attempt to avoid vendor lock-in. Uh, if you look at recording systems today, they have to deal with all kinds of proprietary interfaces, and um, if you have, if you've chosen an oddball, say, call taking system, you may only have one or two choices of logging services because they, they're the only ones that have worked it out. So we, a lot of our standardization is based on making sure that vendors interchange. But, but uh, a bigger, a bigger notion is being able, we, we have this notion, there's a, there's kind of a rule that says that our, <clears throat> the, the main data transfer between elements it's called an emergency incident data object. It's everything one agency knows about an incident. But it is what the state of the incident is known by the sender at the time it was sent. So it has no history in it. 
So if you want to go get history on any incident, you got to go to the logger to do it. Um, and that's uniformly held. You get only current state when state is transferred in most of the, interact the protocol interactions between elements. And you go to the logger to get anything you, you want to know about history. So that's the other primary reason why we standardize is that everybody's going to be hitting the logger more often than in current systems. Current systems, the logger is only retrieved for legal purposes or QA purposes well after the call. In, in next gen uh, 911 and 112, the logger is hit during a, an incident because it's the only place there's history. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is that the, this, this logger component is expected to spit out these VCONs um, and for some of these downstream purposes that you're talking about. Yes, All right. during the incident. During okay. the incident, you're correct. Do you see the VCON being used between the, I mean, again, I, contact centers and PSAPs are a bit different. Um, so that's why I'm asking these questions. Like in a normal yes. contact center, the, the, the voice, you know, the, the, the call processing engine is distinct from the recording one. Uh, SIPREC is also used between them sometimes too. Um, do you see VCONs between the call taking system and the recording system or that's, that's all real time and, and not in scope for you think for VCON? Uh, I think it's all real time, but we'll see how this all hurts out. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really sure how this is all going to work out. I, I can, I will say this, there is a notion of something called an instant recall recorder. That's, you know, pay, play me back the last 30 seconds of the call. I think I missed something. Yeah. Well, it'd be certainly cool if you could, you know, replay the last 30 seconds of a VCon, right? I don't, but it depends on what that means and what's in there and a bunch of other things. So I'm, I'm, I don't know yet because I'm not sure how this all VCon thing is gonna gonna evolve. How useful it's gonna be during an incident? I don't know yet. Got Can't it. Tell. Okay. Yeah, it's worth noting for the for the Connex Center case I pointed out to um, most of our connections between the um, the call taking equipment, i.e., the Connex Center core and the recording system, are real time. So it's a mix of SIPREC and then like a bunch of vendors like us have proprietary protocols that have more. Uh, stuff in it than, than in um, SIPREC. But I, I think there's a growing need, and that's what's interesting to me, to deal with cases when there's like a, a disconnect between those things and someone in the recording system needs to catch up. Like, oh, I missed an hour of recordings because there was downtime or an internet, you know, Cloudflare had another problem or whatever, right? So um, there you would want a post-call transfer uh, to ensure that all nothing's been lost. So for me, that's the the use case of VCon in that leg, um, in addition to the real time one. I don't know if the same applies in the PSAP. Yeah, we don't have any batch anything usually, but you know, I, I, I we I always worry about failures, and so we can invent some. Okay, okay. we're right on schedule. This is great. <laughs> now. What are we doing with the Rohan? Uh, is, is this deck there? Yeah. Or do I have to do the same thing? So I approved it and moved it in. But how did you get it to show, show up in the thing? Uh, you go to three dots, upload and manage slides. Um, let's see. Not there. Did he, did he email him? Presenter. Right, you do. All right. Um, this is the same problem I had. I approved it, but it didn't show up. Um, yeah, I, I tried doing that. I'll, I'll do it again. Um, Don't see it. Repositories. So there is a. I don't know. Let's see. Up there, there. This one? Meeting material? Yeah. Yeah, it's in. Oh, refreshed. Yes. Well, this is all for John's further amusement on the uh, 
fun in the transcript on how we can't get the slideshow working. So you're welcome. Rohan, did you did you email it to me? Uh, no, I didn't. But it is it's showing up on the meeting materials page separately. So. I know. Um, so there did is... you close the browser tab and reload the page? <laughs> Um, no, that in any case there, you can share you can share a, directly from from your computer from the slides right. that are on the meeting yeah, materials page. I'll, I'll download it. Okay. So anyway, I I can just talk through the first. Yep. Go ahead, do that while we're working on it. So I'm Rowan May, I'm active in MLS and Mimi, uh, and some top here to talk about instant messaging use cases. Uh, and there are two specific use cases that I mentioned during the BOF last time. Um, the first one is if I have an instant messaging client and I have several instant messaging uh, client the devices, like I have um, a phone and a desktop and a laptop, and um, and I add a new client. Let's say I you know replace my phone, I get a new phone. Uh, I don't have the keying material from my old phone um, because we don't want to do that. That's like not good security practices. So I create a new client and I want to synchronize my history with my other clients. So I could do this by, uh, by backing up my, my history from one of my clients and then sharing between an existing client and, or an old client and a new client. Um, so that first use case is securely sharing message history from an existing device to a new device. The second case here is if I have um, a group chat, I think we've all been in the situation where we're discussing something with three or four people and then it's like, oh, well, we should bring in such and such. And so we add, you know, one or two more people and it's like, okay, let's bring you up to date uh, here. Let me copy and paste this like big chunk of conversation history that happened. Uh, would be much nicer if you could just go and like say, okay, bring up to date from here. And you take that whole history and it, it sticks in in some common format, encrypts it and puts it somewhere and then sends the keys to that, uh, to that person. They can go and download it and decrypt it. And then they get the history from just, you know, from only the point that the administrator said, here you go. Okay. So what would that look like? Um, oh, and then, I mean, I guess you could always just say, what if I want to back up my messages? That's another third possible, you know, not to, not to look at the sort of stupid, obvious case first, but uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a little small, but um, I don't know who is already familiar with the VCon syntax, but the idea here was for this to to be vaguely representative of that syntax. So there's a VCon object, and then um, there is a, there's an object called a parties array. And so under that, I could have all of the parties that are represented in this particular VCon object. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna flag three specific new, uh, not claims, new uh, objects object names uh, that would be useful here. So the first one is uh, under the parties list, uh, I have a name. And in this case, you know, we're talking about instant messaging. So maybe what I want to refer to this person by is their sort of handle or their canonical uh, username on the instant messaging system. And I could do that with a URI and might as well use the IM URI scheme. So I can call it an IM URI. So here, Alice with the IMURI, I am colon at Alice at example.com. 
Uh, and I presumably would have a list of, uh, let's say, I, I think in this example, 14, uh, 15 different parties in this list. And then I would go into the dialogue. And then the dialogue object would have, it is an array of individual messages uh, and, or individual, uh, what do you call them? And, dialogue objects. So inside of the dialogue array. Um, and some of these are standard, like the start, uh, the type, the list of parties. So here in the, the, first, in the first message there, um, I'm going to add one new element called the message ID because uh, Mimi says there's a message ID in the content format. And incidentally, if you look at the Mimi content format draft, these are the messages from you know, the examples, the first uh, one, two, three, four, five, the first six examples in the Mimi content draft. Uh, so in this first one here, I've got the message ID, I've got the, the timestamp is translated into the start, the start, and it's type text. Parties is the list of parties who are active in the MLS group that corresponds to that room at that moment. So here I've got zero through 12 show up in this list. The originator of this message is party two. This is a markdown message and it says, hi everyone, we just shipped release two, good work. And the disposition is render. Then the next message is a reply. So it's got its message ID, it's time, it's a text message. The parties here, the parties array is different. So there's no, the parties four, five, and six have been removed from the group at this point and parties 13 and 14 have been added. Uh, the originator of this message is party number four. And this is a reply. So it, we need an additional, an additional field to say this is in reply to something. Um, Again, the disposition is render, it's a markdown message and it says, right, right on, congratulations all. I also have a like uh, as my next message. This looks very similar because this is also, this is uh, reactions or likes are basically a, re a, a reply with a disposition of reaction. And here my MIME type is text plain instead of text markdown because I don't need a markdown for my reactions. I have a mention, again, this is like all very much following the, the content format draft in Mimi. Um, these two are a little bit interesting. So most instant messaging systems have a concept of editing or deleting messages. And we want to preserve the, the old message. And when we reply, we could be replying to a specific version of a message. So the in reply, the in reply to message ID, that corresponds to a particular message ID. That message could have been edited or deleted, but I'm replying to a given version of that message. Um, so in this case, this edit, there was a typo. Instead of saying, right on, congratulations, y'all, he wrote, congratulations, all. And so Bob corrects this. So it says, right on, congratulations, y'all. Um, and then this other message here, this is actually deleted um, because what we're doing is replacing the message with a body that is null. So you know, this doesn't look like such a stretch to be able to represent this in the VCon format. I did this in 15 minutes in the back of the room before, before, the presenta before my presentation, during Jonathan's presentation, I guess. Um, so, um, yeah. What do people think? Does it seem like a reasonable use of VCon? We got at the mic. John Jonathan. Jonathan. Hey, so um, I'm, I'm not sure it's a good use case for VCon. I'm still trying to figure it out. One of the questions to me is like, how come you just didn't include the content format 
draft, like this almost looks like an alternative content format. Wouldn't you want for the Mimi cases to just literally send the content format exactly as it was sent in real time? Um, that may be a question more for the for you know the authors of the Vcon format. Um, but what it sounds like you're proposing is that there would be a body which would have a mime type of application dash uh, slash Mimi dash content. And then you would still maybe want to reproduce some of these headers like the start parties originator uh, and type. Well, so I guess I was coming at a little different direction, which is like, if you thought the right way to do these catch up and sync use cases in Mimi, just forget VCon for the second, like, if you thought the best way to do that was effectively have a way to do a offline transfer of a sequence of content, Mimi content objects, then you would actually conclude that you don't use VCon for that you, because it, because that's not what you want. You don't want a VCon, you want a different object, which is a sequence of Mimi content objects. The only reason in my mind you would say, oh, VCon is better is because you've concluded for some reason that you want a different object format for the these sync and catch up cases than you do for real time. And that's the part I don't understand why you would want that. Okay, there, so there are two reasons why you wouldn't do that in Mimi with the content format draft. The first one is administrative and the second one is technical. The administrative reason is that history, catch up, sync, backups are all out of scope of Mimi. Um, basically, you know, Mimi is supposed to be about the providers talking to the providers and the providers really don't, you know, frankly don't give a crap about what happens between the client and the local provider, which uh, in this case, this is client to client or client to provider. Uh, and then from a technical perspective, uh, you're missing a little bit of information if you were gonna go store this on disk, you know, for backups, which is the, um, in the Mimi content format, we assume that information that you got from the end-to-end -end encryption protocol is not repeated in the content format. So the MLS group in which this was sent, the sender and who the parties are, this information is available from MLS or you know, if you were using some other end-to-end -end encryption protocol, it would be available from that protocol. It's not available for Mimi. The content format just doesn't have those fields. I don't know if that okay. changes your uh, opinion of this, but you know. Well, I mean, it. Uh, we, we've had debates about whether some of that MLS information should anyway show up in the common format, but but I understand your point. Okay, thank you. Dan, any other comments on this? Yeah, Dan. Dan's in line. Yeah. So um, the the thing I want to point out is, I I, I think it's it's certainly part of the the use cases that I envision where. Um, you know, a conversation may cross multiple modes, right? And so I've got a, I've got a Mimi conversation, I've got a video conference, I've got a, uh, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, you just think of, you know, I had a video conference in Slack, for instance, or something like that, right? But capturing all that information, um, you know, encompass, encompasses, you know, Mimi basically uh, as as a as a piece of that. Uh, and and so from that perspective, I I, I think that's that's useful. And it's kind of a uh, super set of functionality of the, you know, here's a conversation I want to I want to reference and catch somebody up on. Um, yeah, um, I'll also add that in in uh, like the more enterprise instant messaging use cases, for example, you know, financial and healthcare institutions, they have logging requirements. It if they if they wanted to go and take information and share it, I think, you know, right up your alley, Jonathan, like the, the taking this information and having it in a common format, this would be, you know, an obvious common format with which to share that information. And going, going, gone. Thank you. Uh, actually, yeah, nobody. Can I ask a 
quick clarify. So I, no. I'm confused that if you're advocating that the constructs of Beacon should incorporate this, or you really do need the formatting of Mimi to accomplish what you want to do. Like, are, are you saying there's missing constructs that should be added, or, or really Mimi is so different that it needs its own format? Um, so let's let's say you know I presented this particular um, this particular format with a couple of additional you know one two three four or five new fields for Vcon. Um, if you took the approach where you were including the content format. Uh, where the where the MIME type was application slash uh, Mimi dash content, and then the body was a binary body with that information, then you wouldn't need the message ID. You wouldn't need the replaces. You wouldn't need the um, reply to message ID. Those those you could just ignore. Right. Those would just be those go away, you would still want to have probably like an IMURI or some other kind of identifier for the, the party, the handle of the party or the username of the party. Right. OK. Thank you. Good. Dan, you're up. My name's Dan Petrie uh, from CPZ. Um, I wrote a draft, uh, next slide, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, proposing a solution. And uh, I, I'm not going to talk too much about solution uh, today, uh, but I'm going to focus on kind of some of the experiences that we've had and uh, things we've observed and things we've learned by having uh, an implementation and, hack and uh, hackathon. We, we've been... Uh, um, at uh, the last four hackathons, uh, and we have, uh, and I, I'm aware of this, uh, of uh, at least one point in time, there were four different uh, implementations out there of the of the Beacon uh, container proposed, and uh, at least two of those I think are still active today. I'm I'm not sure what the status on the other ones, but uh, but uh, just I, I think we've learned a few things that I just wanted to share here, and I'm not. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about the draft too much, uh, other than just here's some additional, additional information that we, we found, learned along the way. Next slide. Um, along the way, we learned, we've added uh, you know, uh, some additional fields, right? Uh, uh, created at dates, uh, updated date, um, you know, in the last where, where Vcon has been modified after the initial creation. Um, you know, the date of, uh, uh, for attachment objects wasn't in the spec originally. Uh, product uh, label for analysis objects was, was, was something that we uh, discovered along the way that was missing. Uh, the, uh, we added a, um, a transfer type dialogue object, you know, and I think John, Jonathan alluded to, you know, there are transfer cases in, in contact centers and, uh, so uh, we had, you know, before Jonathan's draft out, we had, it was out. We actually we had in, encountered this as a as a problem in uh, in uh, some of the cases we were trying to prototype, and uh, so we added the the concept of a of a transfer dialogue object uh, to to kind of capture that uh, that uh, that information. Um, and then uh, disposition was another thing that we had missing, and I think you know, that's that's come up in a couple. Couple different scenarios. The the, um, the one thing that we, we don't have kind of a solution yet. I haven't had a chance to think about, but uh, has come up is uh, the concept of, of parties aren't always known upfront uh, in some scenarios. You know, you, you know. I think originally I had the thought that oh, you know, you, you know who parties are the conversation, and you know maybe you're adding more along the, the way. But I, I hadn't thought of it, uh, the scenario where. Um, you don't, you know, you may have some dialogue, some recordings, or whatever, and you don't know who all the parties are, right? And uh, 
that's something you discover over time. And uh, so that's that was kind of that's kind of a problem that uh, I need to spend some more time thinking about and uh, seeing how we can uh, accommodate accommodate that uh, and going on. But next slide. Uh, some things that we haven't, you know, that we that I uh, talked about in the in the draft, but haven't. I don't feel had done a, a lot with in uh, any kind of prototype or real world scenarios enough to, to say that we we understand these 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 uh, um, features or or use cases or that they you know they they uh, they solve things that, that in, in the right way. But um, you know, I mean, Jose works right. I mean, that's that's not the question here. The the, the kind of the issue is, um, you know. And, and we've we've actually implemented uh, you know using Jose for signing and verification and and, uh, and encryption and decryption. Uh, what we haven't done is we haven't used these in kind of production environment situations to know you know what are the problems of you know do we, do we have to do some additional labeling um, outside of that or or uh, you know are are, are there uh, issues the way we're we're actually doing this uh, that may uh, May not work in 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 real life scenarios. So, and then uh, uh, you know we have these other concepts of these kind of referential of vcons where you can group vcons. You hear a vcon that is a parent that groups a bunch of vcons, or uh, when you have a signed or encrypted vcon and you want to modify it, um, you know the, the concept of having an amendment or uh, a redaction. I think these are again these we've not implemented this in, in the open source. Uh, and we've not prototyped it or anything like that, and so that's that's something I think we don't have a lot of experience yet, and kind of something that we uh, we need to work on to uh, to get a better feel for for um, you know if if this approach is going to work or not. Next slide. Um, you know, I think the big to do you know for this draft right now is basically gap analysis, right? Uh, Jonathan uh, put together a great great draft. Um, you know, Brian and, and Rowan both have uh, some great use cases. We've not spent any time to, you know, look at what what we, you know, is and isn't covered, and uh, and uh, to, to to see uh, that we can accommodate all that. And uh, so that's that's kind of the, the big to do for uh, for the uh, for the draft. Next slide. Uh, does Brian, do you have a question? Oh, well, um, just something to think about. Um, I talked a lot about in our use case that we have this standardized logging service. Well, the standardized logging service standardly, standardly signs log entries. Um, and then it turns out in the environment that we're in, we have a full KKI. So everybody has certs and it all works. So I start worrying about how many variations of signatures of any given object I've got and how that interworks with what's going on here. But we we're already signing lots of things and signing vcons is not a problem it's just how many variations of the same thing am i signing <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i mean it's not required right you know to use a vcon yeah. to, for it to be signed but but you know if if there is a, is is a requirement then then yeah we need to 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 take that yeah we always argue we always argue in emergency services that non-repudiation is an actually valuable thing to have. <laughs> yes, you actually did say that. <laughs> next slide. Okay. Yeah, next, next slide. And so um, I guess, you know, uh, I would love to have uh, people kick tires on this, right? Uh, give, give this stuff a try. Um, you know, there's, uh, we've got, a, you know, Python packages available. It's, uh, you know, a library and, and a CLI. We've got a server package coming, uh, you know, down the roads very soon. Um, and, you know, there's a repo, but uh, I'd love to have people, you know, if, if there's some place opportunity to, to give it a try in your, you know, industry and in, in your use case, I, I, I would love to uh, love to, to work with you or hear about, uh, you know, your experience with, with, with using this stuff, because uh, it just, it helps us, you know, helps us with the requirements, how it helps us with use cases. So that's all I had. Great. Thanks.
I guess to follow up on Brian's question for signing and encryption, just to ask, I noticed in the draft, you, 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 you do that for URL reference content. Is that the primary thing, or it could be even things within the VCon itself? The, you know, there, there are <laughs> kind of three things, right? So for things that are externally referenced, there, there's just a, um, uh, it's just a hash, right? And, and right. Uh, if, if there's you know, integrity over the whole, whole uh, VCon, then, you, then the whole VCon would be signed, is, 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 the, is, is the concept, using, uh, using Jose. Okay. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>、Uh, well, we are, yeah, we're, we're right on time.、Um, actually, we're a few minutes early. We have 15 minutes.、Um, what is there、uh, something useful we could、uh, accomplish with our 15 minutes or? Are we done? Yeah, actually, we do. Go ahead. But that's fine. We yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not paying attention. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I guess. What I would love is,、um, I mean, I, I love all these use cases, right? And, and so I, <laughs> I think they're all great.、Um, but I would love to, you know, other opinions. And, you know, I know we're not making decisions on whether, whether these are,、uh, you know, work group、uh, items or not, but I would love to hear from, I mean, I, I, if we could use the last couple minutes here to get, you know, other people to stand up and say, Yeah, this is, these, these use cases are interesting or they're not or, or whatever. I just, I'd love any kind of feedback that we could get from、uh, the rest of the audience here on, on these use cases. And,、uh, yeah, you know, are, are we heading in the right direction?、Uh, Colin j a m e s let's go.、Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll, I'll see the cue to Colin. Go ahead. You're in the room. Yeah. No, I'll get on the cue proper. Go ahead. All right. All right. Uh, what I was going to say is, I mean, I think these use cases are interesting. It also is pretty clear from the, from the presentations, there's a, a wide swath of metadata that's unique to each of these individual use cases. And it would sort of be crazy、yeah. to be honest to put like every contact center metadata field into the core of econ draft. So the way, the way this presentation makes me think about it is we should, like, the ideal way to proceed would be to have like a baseline econ format. That contains the super common stuff, you know, list of segments, participant IDs, you know, timestamps that are like no brainer, independent of any use case, and you must have them. And then to have this concept of like、uh, extension, you know, an extensibility framework that allows for a contact center extension that adds a collection of attributes you need to contact center. And just to make sure the base format it supports、uh, naming extensibility that allows you to sort of. Support or not support those as a group and ignore them as a group if you understand the extension and what have you. And then we could build separate extensions for Connex Center, for 911, or what have you. That feels like a way、uh, that might make sense to move forward、um, on, on the standardization activities for this. Thank you. Cody. Awesome. Thank you.、Um, I just wanted to bring this up. I've been following the standard for only about two weeks now after Tom Howe cued me into it.、Um, so I operate the engineering firm for a common voice carrier. And we're actually looking to implement VCon as our minimum unit of truth inside our network.、Um, and I think, kind of following along with,、um, with the last speaker, it, it does make sense to have just that. That core common VCon framework. And then we have a bunch of metadata similar to a contact center, but in different format that we would want to attach to the VCon as well. So I'm wondering is the, right, is the right way to look there as an extension of the VCon format or an in, a modification of the attachments segment so that we can attach that object there instead?
Thanks. Um, well, I, and we'll have to, I don't think we need responses. We don't have authors and stuff, but I think continuing the discussion on that particular item is going to occupy a bunch of email time, I hope, not meeting time. Colin, you're up. <laughs> um, so Colin, I, I, I mean, I continue to think this looks really useful for a bunch of things. Uh, and uh, it's been a little bit challenging to get more people sort of involved with it, but it's, it's right on that edge of peripheral of many other things that are going on. One thing sort of watching, particularly the, the Mimi content one made me think, you know, the more we can think, it, we're, we're trying to bring data into this that's probably coming from existing data records that will get extended in their own way in their own protocols. So let's just hypothetically in Mimi, if there was a content draft and then over time it's going to get extended, how can we allow that to get extended without having to replicate all the things over here? I think that that should be sort of a, a litmus test we can use in deciding how to break things up inside of things. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sort of saying the same thing other people have said here of like, let's you know figure out how to have the, the minimal super data and then point at other records of this various things. That will result in the problem of, um, you know, phone calls have one idea of identity. Maybe it's something like a V card um, in, in one context and other things have the idea of what it might look like in uh, stir shaken as a source of identity and I am might have a different source of it. And they're all almost the same and overlapping, but we're going to have to pick our battles. We can either try and, you know, invent a common format across multiple types of data representing the same semantic information, or we can choose to have, multiple types of representations of the same semantic information given the context it came from. And I think that later one is probably the direction we should go. I may not have said that very clearly, but that's um, looking around to see if I made any sense to anyone. So, you know, that, that no, no, it, it, yeah. it made sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, I, I, I mean, <laughs> Rowan, the, tr the transferring uh, IM data from one of my devices to another made me think like that may be the, the least exciting application of it, but I still want exactly what you're talking about, but probably for things like backup, legal, uh, you know, legal compliance, um, and then obviously for training uh, data and stuff pulling out. So uh, I, I, I really like the direction of this. It's great. Thanks. Yeah, I, w I was trying. I was this is Chris. I, I was thinking in the same context of we need an abstraction layer for the systems that know how to process the data, and new things that come in may need that abstraction layer as well. Dan, yeah, I, it's a little bit where I was gonna gonna comment. Um, I mean, I we've got these different use cases, but I think there is overlap, right? Um, and not just you know, you know what's currently in the uh, in in the solution um, but I think there's other additional overlap of, of some of the, these use cases that have come forward and but we don't always call them the same thing right and so I think um, there's there's some work here to to say oh well that's kind of what we call you know X is what we kind of what we call y and 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 you know if we can find these uh, abstractions, you know, I think there is a, a fair amount of overlap here on, on some of these things that uh, that, that uh, make sense to be in, you know, a core, you know, or, you know, base fu functional layer. Yeah. Um, I'm next in the queue. Um, uh, I, I, I do think that um, the notion that we have different use cases that have different pieces of data is really useful, but the notion that we have common things across these use cases is also useful. And perhaps what we want is kind of like a two level thing where we have an extensible list of attributes with, with alternate views of those attributes and then groups of attributes that you might have in an application. So if, 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 we, we've ha if we have a common notion in two applications, we ought to, that ought to be the same thing. And even if there are uh, different representations of it, um, even within one application, sometimes we have different representations of the same thing. Um, we, we, we might want to have, a, you know, this is kind of a multivariate view of it, but you still might want to have a, a single thing. If I, if I know about a, a participant, well, I might have three different ways of representing that participant, but that participant might occur in, you know, multiple 
um, multiple use cases. So we want to have the, a, an individual list of, of, of attributes, have variations of how we represent that, and then have groups of those attributes that are common to an application. Thanks. Yeah, I think we're all sort of saying similar things here about a, you know, a two layer structuring to the thing. Um, I think that this sort of, if we think that's a good direction, it, it, it says a few things. One is that it becomes super useful to have early on in the process drafts that sort of indicate what are the, some of the attributes that they might want. Even if you don't get them in the main VCon spec, you look for these overlaps that Brian just talked about to maybe you decide to promote one of them into the main draft because it turns out, oh, everybody needed this thing. Let's just put it in the, in the common draft. Um, the second thing I was going to say is it also helps you think about the baseline spec as being really focused on what is it that's mandatory to include, right? Because that's the stuff that has to be in the baseline spec. You don't have to have everything that might be interesting. You just have to have the ones that are mandatory to include. Anything that's not mandatory to include then that can go in an extension spec for one of these different use cases. The, the thing we have to look out for is the, you know, the slippery slope for which ITF is infamous, which is like the great thing about standards is we have so many of them, which is, you know, you end up in this case where any useful usage of econ requires some permutation of these extensions and different vendors include different subsets of the extensions and different econ formats. And you need the econ negotiation protocol to indicate which extensions you want and like, you know, We've been there, we've done that many times. So we have to counterbalance it with putting enough in the, in, as, as either mandatory to include or in the base spec so that it is pretty standalone useful. So I, I think that's gonna be one of the tensions that we face in the standardization effort. Anyone else wanna say something? Going once? Going twice, we give you half an hour back. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you, Brian. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be there. Was the problem also for you that the food is just not good enough in Prague, or no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, that's the, the, it was the beer. I just can't the take beer. the beer. <laughs> uh, <I see. laughs> All right. All right. Take care, Brian.